Uh, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the Lord's Day, and this is our corporate gathering of the local body of Christ, our spiritual family, and we gather to worship the God of our salvation. It's no mistake that it falls on Sunday, the day when Jesus rose from the dead, having put an end to our sin and alienation from God. He was raised up from the dead, resulting in our justification before our God. And so we worship this morning in a living hope, and what a hope it is. And so we're going to look at a beautiful verse this morning, if you'll turn to Romans 8. If you're visiting with us, I'd like to welcome you. We are glad to have you with us in our worship service this morning. We're studying through the book of Romans, and we kind of stalled out just a little bit in chapter 8. Just what we're seeing is so rich right here. Let me just read verse 4, what we're going to look at. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That, that's a big statement right there, in order that the law might be fulfilled in us. And that's going to take a whole sermon then for us to unpack. But if you'll be patient and you'll walk with me this morning, there's a lot of connections we got to work through in our minds to get to our hearts. Um, you're going to get a, a beautiful blessing. I can't believe the beauties of what I've seen in this verse and what impact it has made on my own heart. And so I'm asking that God would do that in all of yours this morning as well. I want this to be the life verse of Southside Bible Church. And so let's go to the throne of grace and ask for that grace to be poured out upon us as we study this verse. And, and may the fruit of our time be a whole body, a whole church fulfilling the law of Christ, which is this. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And the infinite love of Christ is the whole new standard of what it is, of what we're going to be seeking this morning in the Word of God, what we just read in 1 Corinthians 13. That is the fulfillment of the whole law, and that's what I desire for each and every one of you. So let's go to the throne of grace and pray for that. Father, I thank you for this beautiful verse, and God, I pray that by your Spirit you would teach us through this inspired word that you would draw out its truth, its meaning, and that you would help us to understand it, that our hearts, our affections would be made full, and that our lives would walk according to what this truth is. And so God, may the fruit of this morning be agape love all over the place. God, let the sweet aroma of Christ fill this room, and it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen. Well, I just can't get over all that Paul has put in these first four verses. They're crucial and they're connected that I need to review to put it all together to unpack verse four this morning. And then we'll look at the rest of the chapter, and he will just keep unfolding verses one through four deeper and deeper. So foundation to chapter eight is these four verses. And really the whole epistle as we're going to journey. And so this could be really the epicenter of the epistle or, or maybe the, the full application of the epicenter that we saw in Romans 3 when we looked at the cross. And so the cross is, this is what the, the application, this is what comes out of it. And so let's get this gem and set it in its context and enjoy pure gold this morning together. So here's your outline. We began it two weeks ago, but in Romans 8, 1 through 4. We're going to look at two reasons why there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're looking at a freedom that is gained and a frailty that is fixed. From Paul's letter so far, I see two really big foundational problems with mankind, with many fruits that are springing out from these roots in our day and age on a constant basis. When the world talks about the problems of this world, they never mention these two. I just can't find this in Newsweek. That is why we never get to the real solution. And their solutions are things like we need to educate people more. We need moral reform. We need more government. That's why whenever we try to fix a problem, it only gets worse, as it is in our country right now. Like racism, real sin. But the solution by the world, and unfortunately some even in the church today, is creating more racism and drawing it out more than any time in my lifetime. And so to fix the problems of this world, we have to fix two foundational problems and we need to begin talking about those. 
And they just so happen to be what Paul is teaching us through this epistle. First, we all stand under a rightful condemnation of God. The wrath of God in Romans 1.18 is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness who suppress the truth of God. And secondly, we're rebellious to our creator from our very core of our being. We rebel against our God and what he requires of us. We want to be God. We prefer all that, is, that he made over him. That's the systemic problem of this world. It produces all kinds of sins. It produces evil and hatred and superiority and clans and racial discrimination and immoralities and coveting and uh, Wall Street crimes and self. And it just all the evilness of Romans 1 comes out of that. That's the problem that must be fixed. And that's what Paul's addressing. It needs to be remedied. And that is why I do what I do. The only remedy is the gospel. And I refuse to spend all of my days trying to fix symptoms instead of going to the root. And we have the cure for the root, people of God. And we've been looking at it for about a year. And it is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to bring us into this realm of salvation. I'm willing to go to jail for it. And by the grace of God, only to die for it because I truly believe it that much. And so I want you to hear this because it's so relevant. There's a way that, that we try to fix this problem with sin and it's called law. It's called good works. It's called cleaning yourself up, moral reform. And Paul has showed us that the law can't fix our problem. We've seen that the law, no matter what you do, trying to obey that and clean yourself up, you can't get out from under the rightful condemnation of God from the sin of Adam to our own sins daily. And secondly, it can't change your heart to want to be rebellious to your creator. God's called us to love him and love others and love our enemies and our spouses and our brothers and sisters and people who are different than us. God's called us to love them. And if you turn to the law for either of those two things, you're just going to get further away from each one. If you look at the law to justify you, to get you right before God, it just stirs up sin and makes it worse. If you look to the law to be sanctified, to, to grow yourself, it stirs up sin and it can take something beautiful like law and start trying to justify yourself before God with your morality, to condemn other people with your standard to feel self-righteous and try to get approval in the church so everybody looks at you and thinks you're beautiful, to justify hatred in your heart with a Bible. What do you turn to for the remedy? Children, what is always the right Sunday school answer? Uh, Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> you turn to Jesus for both. And we're going to look at the unfolded word of God this morning for that answer. And may our time in the word leave the sweet aroma of Christ in this place. Let's, let's pray. Father, meet us as we unpack this now. God, I pray that everyone in this room would see that we look to Christ. And in him is justification and sanctification and salvation ultimately. God, let, let all have eyes to see the author and perfecter of faith. God, let us be done with Moses. Let us be done with law, trying to rub up against it and make ourselves right before God. Lord, let everyone see if they've gotten off in this in any way that you would set them free this morning. God, it's for freedom that Christ came and set us free. Let everyone in this room drink from those waters and know them deeply, I pray. Amen. Freedom gained. Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're declared justified before God and there's no more condemnation that will ever come upon you again. Romans 8.2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of death. This is now you've been set free to live holy, to live different lives unto God. And so the law of sin and death it's a great power in our lives. And Adam, it ruled, it reigned us, it controlled us. We were under condemnation. We all lived in that. 
but the law of the spirit of life has set you free from that condition and that sphere in which you lived. The Holy Spirit joins you to Christ and he is the fount of every blessing. And now from Christ, the spirit gives us everything from Christ. He gives you a new heart. He takes your rebellion and he replaces it now with love and desire to the king. You're set free for a life to be lived to God. And we keep saying this phrase already, but not yet. There's still coming attractions where we're going to be set free from sin finally, totally, and permanently. So you don't turn to the law to change. I want you to hear that. You don't turn to the law to get yourself holy. You turn to Christ. That is the only remedy for our remaining sin. And I love that it's not a whole bunch of turning to different things, like different aspects of Christianity. Turn to this, turn to that. It's just all one big turning to Christ. Justification, sanctification, fix your eyes on Jesus as you run. Glorification, we shall become like him because we shall see him face to face. All glory be to Christ. That's the freedom that was gained. And then we looked At the frailty then that is fixed, look with me in verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, the gospel of grace, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned (coughs) sin in the flesh. So we said the law is good at condemning. It can tell you the standard and condemn you for not keeping it. It was really good at that. What it couldn't do is get the condemnation off of you. So God put his son up on a cross and he condemned him in your place for your sin so that now what the law could not do, God did in sending his son and he got condemnation off of you. That's the glorious news of the gospel. And now verse four, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And so I feel bad. I said, I was just going to preach one verse. I'm actually going to preach half a verse this morning. (laughs) And it, it couldn't bring sanctification. The, the law couldn't get you right with God, and it can't grow you in your walk with God. Verse 4. And so our focus this morning is how our frailty is fixed in regards to us fulfilling what the law of God required of us. Overcoming our rebellion to God unto humble submission to our God. And the law couldn't do that, but we're going to see now that the gospel can and does do that. And so we've learned that we have uh, reigning sin when we were in Adam. We've learned that. And now, believer, this sin is now just remaining, but it has power left. It's still a renegade within our own bodies. And we have all these desires running around in us that want to create what we called epithumias, over desires for things more than God. And they're, they're trying to get us to want something in this world that God has said, don't or do. And, and to say, I want that. I'm willing to have that over God. And that's how this remaining sin works within us by preferring something else to our great God who has saved us in Christ Jesus. And so my question as we journey through that is then how do we fight? How do we battle? Do we run to the law, seek commands, fight our flesh with some good old determination? We've already seen that the law stirs it up and that we will use law and just spin it and use it for our own self-justification and judgmentism. One preacher said the law just gives a new theater for rebellion. So hear this. If we turn to law to make you better, it will make you worse. You'll sweep up the room and the dust will choke you. And uh, is that true for anyone in this room? I hate to say it, but half my Christianity was me trying to do that. How do we get this part of our frailty fixed in sanctification? This is God's design that we need a greater desire to rule and reign over us. In Christ Jesus, it is He. And for him to be seen by faith in the word of God and to be reminded and treasured and to to overcome our fight with sin, we need something greater. And and Moses doesn't do it for me, but Jesus does. And we, we can't find that in the law. 
We find it in Christ. Paul's going to say in chapter 10, the end of the law, the telos of the law, is not to just sit with sin aroused and condemned and destroying us. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes is Christ Jesus. I can't make enough of him. I think if I had to say my greatest frustration as a preacher is that he's so lovely and he's the completion of everything and he's the summing up of all things in Christ. I just wish there were more English words or Greek words to express all that he is to us. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I'm not going to spend my days looking at Moses when I got Christ. And therefore, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And so my question this morning, how do I fulfill the law then? Is you just told me that we have to move away from it. Remember Romans 7, 4, and 6? You got to die to the law if you're ever going to bear fruit. So I, I got to die to the law. I got to move away from it. So how do I fulfill the law then as a believer if you're saying I got to die and I got to move away from it? How do I become loving? I have to die to the law that commanded it. And I got to be joined to Christ. We saw in Romans 7, 4, that I might fulfill the law. And the fruit, he said, that will come out of this marriage is going to be love. And so you can get a life of God. You, you can get a life of God kind of love called agape, not by law, but by the Spirit who points us to Jesus and leads us to him to desire to love as he has loved you. The Spirit will be that floodlight on Christ. You see him, his beauty, his glory, and I just want to love the way he has first loved me. Simple, right? I think so. So let's work through this verse together as a church that... Um, we can, we, can, we can get this. So let, let's go one more time. Romans 8, 4. <clears throat> what is the aim and purpose of the work of Christ? In verse 1, no condemnation. Verse 3, to, to get that off by condemning sin in Christ. So I'm no longer under condemnation. I love that. He condemned my sin in the body of Jesus and all my sins were forgiven. If you're visiting here this morning, that's the only way to get rid of your sin. Thank you, God. And so my question, is that the end goal of, of redemption? Let's just go to glory if it is. <laughs> Why are we still here? We get to live these lives in enemy territory till God now calls us home for our new master and his glory. We, we get to live for him and follow him and put this Jesus on display by our message and by our lives. It's a great privilege. Our lives matter to God. And he didn't just take care of one part. He took care of the penalty of sin, and he took care of the power, the ruling, reigning power. And, and, and he's going to take care of that, the, the, the penalty. Uh, I'm sorry, taking care of the penalty sets us free now to take care of the power, and the power is going to be taken care of in stages. Okay, we're going to see it called mortification and putting it to death. It's a progression. Justification all at once. Sanctification is a, a progression. So there's a henna clause here in verse 4, which is a purpose. What's the purpose? Why did he condemn sin in the flesh in Jesus? So that the purpose is that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And so it isn't just, I love my justification and I'm just going to spend my days sitting up on the housetop with my pajamas, thinking about it, just loving it. It, it. There's a purpose for it. And the purpose is that you might fulfill the requirement of the law. There's a great aim for the atoning work of Jesus Christ and called the great result, which we'll keep, we'll keep building on and moving till we get to Romans eleven thirty six. 36, from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. But verse two is the liberation of the law of the spirit from what you were in Adam. You've been set free from that bondage and death. Free for what? Well, verse four, you've been set free that results in fulfillment of the law. And so I want you to catch this. This is important. The gospel fulfills what the law could not do in verse 3. It couldn't get condemnation off of you. And the gospel fulfills what God wanted from his children all along. And we're going to call that the law of Christ this morning 
and it's going to be to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The gospel fulfills what God always wanted from his children. And so let's ask a few questions in our text. What is fulfilled? That's going to be important in verse 4. And what's fulfilled is the requirement of the law. I did a lot of wrestling with the word requirement. It's used several times in Romans. Romans 1.32, it's called the ordinance of God. Romans 5.18, it was called the act of righteousness resulting in justification. After looking at all of these uses, I, I just like the translation requirement. So nothing earth shattering. <laughs> the requirement of the law has been fulfilled, but, but what did he fulfill? What's the requirement of the law? And one observation, I don't know if it's crucial or not, but it jumped out to me, is it's in the singular. Just 99 times, so I'm going to call it 100 times in the Old Testament, it talks about the fulfillment of the law. Whenever it does, it always uses the, the plural, that, to keep the requirements of the law. And here, it's singular. And then there's just a lot of thought trying to get to this, reading commentators, and a, here's a couple of the suggestions that I came across is that it could mean like the unity of the law. So it's singular to show here's, here's the unity of the law of God that he gave to Moses. And this would be an expression of the character of the law. And it just rolls all the requirements of the law together called righteous life. Commentator Cranfield said it, it's a unity of a plurality of the commandments just as a whole of the, call it the fatherly will of his children. So kind of a requirement of the will of God. And others where I kind of take both of them together, it's more of a specific requirement, and it's going to be that of love. And if you'll just flip over to Romans 13, 8, here's why I land on this view. <clears throat> Paul says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has what? singular, he's fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, powerful. Any other commandment, here it is, it's summed up in this other saying this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. And I like this because we have fulfilled in a singular aspect here as well, and it's to love. And it fits well to the rest of this letter. Romans 9 says, His love chose you before the foundation of the world to be His. And Romans 10, uh, our, our love as we go to the nations and we preach this gospel of salvation. And then in Romans 12, how do we live in light of justification? He gives this command, let your love be without hypocrisy. Let it be genuine and real. And then in Romans 14 through 15 on liberty issues, as you wrestle with these, he said, let love to God and love to others be the guiding principles. And he just, he's showing you the, the summary of it all is to love. And, and, and this is a fulfillment of all of the law which fits well with Christ, what's the greatest commandment? To love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbors, yourself. And upon these two things hangs the whole law. Here's a summary of the whole thing. What's required? Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. There's the whole, the whole gospel, the whole fulfillment of all. Love, as I have loved you, I've given my life, and I've shed it for you. Galatians 5.13, you were called to freedom. Same con concepts, brethren. Only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Commentator James Dunn adds another thought as well. He says, Paul takes the essential requirement that has always been at what the law was getting at. Each individual requirement that leads to this expression, so the intention or content of the law itself is to be put in one requirement, and that's why it's singular, 
to love. And that just screams to be the flow of the whole Testament to me. God keeps saying, I want your hearts. And, and it's just like today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do all the things that you're supposed to do. Here's the rules. Here's the laws. Here's what I've learned. And you just keep them all. And he says, you, you, you worship me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. And the Pharisees, they, they did all of that. Everyone's always just keeping rules without a heart. And God said, I want your heart. I don't want all these external rules and laws to be kept legalistically. You, I, I want your heart. Circumcise your hearts, he would say to them. Oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. In a land flowing with milk and honey, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Love God. And what is it that God wants from his people? Next week is Father's Day. And what I've always wanted from my children is that they would love God and, and that they would love me. Them obeying me and doing what I have commanded as a requirement has never done it for me. I want your heart. I want your heart for God. I want your love that will flow from those springs and the Pharisees and even today. And maybe some of us sitting in this room need a command, don't love with hypocrisy. God says in Malachi, I wish you'd just close the doors instead of coming in here and giving me your lame offerings and blind animals. I want your hearts. I want your real, genuine hearts. Teach us how to pray. Pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. Go give and do it in secret and fast for God himself and pray Abba. What is the essence of the whole law? It's amazing we got to be reminded of this. What is it that God has required of us? To love him, to flow to all of his image bearers as an expression of our love to him that flows from the expression of his love to us in Christ Jesus. How's it going at boot camp? Well, that's my application later. You guys be waiting for that. How is it fulfilled in us? No surprise. Two main views and maybe a third. How is it fulfilled in us? That's the right question. Is it fulfilled by Christ? His obedience. He was born under the law and he came and he fulfilled it. Is that what Paul's talking about? Or is it our obedience. It's fulfilled by us that, that uh, we've come out from under the law and we've got a freedom now to love. Or is it a combination of both? These are very different answers. Both are true. I'll die on that hill. But Paul meant one of them. And so I, I've been studying and I just felt like I was in Romans 7 all over again. <laughs> God, show me. And I, I have a Stronger conclusion than I did even on Romans 7, but let's look at it. If it's by Christ, which again, many solid godly men hold to. We've been looking at this for a long time, haven't we? Christ was born under the law and he came and he fulfilled its righteous requirements in our place. And he's the only one who ever loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength and his neighbor as himself. You, you read the gospels and you you weep at a love like that. He obeyed the law perfectly. He was a true son. And in Romans 4, this is the basis of our justification. Remember that Greek word, logizomai? God will take the righteousness of Christ and logizomai it to your account. So that when God looks at you, it's as if you did that. In Romans 5, we had a first Adam and a second Adam. And that second Adam, Jesus, when he came, he said he, he, he obeyed in righteousness. And that now is put to your account. So that is the, one of the truest things ever that we've been wrestling with. And the whole reformation was built on it. Your only hope of ever standing in the presence of God accepted is the righteousness of Christ put to your account. And we spent almost a year looking at that. And if you hold this view, I say, yay and amen. It's foundational truth of the gospel and the reformation. And it even fits in this context. That truth has changed my life. 
I didn't understand it for a long time. And I've been trying to reveal it to you, to show it to you from every angle so that you would stand in him and in him complete. Not your own righteousness, but his. Second view is if it's fulfilled by us. And I believe that Paul has already laid out the idea well of Christ's righteousness. And I do not believe that that is what he's going after. Here, do you remember when we hit Romans 6, 14? Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but you're under grace. And we said that was for your sanctification when he's writing that. And I believe that's exactly what he's going after here is our life, our transformation, our sanctification. Both views see that as the outworking uh, of it. So no one's arguing that at all. But Romans 8, 2 He's showing us how that is done now, the coming out from the law of death and under the law of the spirit of life. What is the freedom that you've been set free to? It's set us free. It's set us free to what? The spirit has set us free to fulfill the law ourselves. And we're going to call it the law of Christ. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We all agree that's sanctification. Everyone agrees on that. Your walk, the way you live, You'll walk in a way, not by flesh, but by the Spirit. And Romans 8, 3, the work of Christ is in view for condemning sin. That's the focus, our sin. We're looking at the passive obedience of Christ by dying on a cross. The issue is sin, and the result is death. So God condemns sin in Christ so that the second part could be done. The dominion of sin could be broken so that I can walk in the newness of life that we've been studying in Romans 6. And that newness is what the requirement of the law is. And I want you to take this so deeply to heart, to love. One more thing. In verse 4, it says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And I would have expected for us. He died for us, on our behalf. But he, so that, so that in us, the death was for us and on our behalf, not in us. How is it fulfilled in us? The law is fulfilled in us by the spirit who's, who's, who unites us to Christ and he's in us. He dwells within us. You have God, deity dwelling within to do what? To so you could fulfill the law, to produce, what is the fruit of the spirit? Love. And that spirit now is going to produce something that you could have never got under the law before. You could keep external requirements, but you could never love God or love others without the work of the spirit. So I think what we see of Jesus is his great cross work. I want to make sure I didn't get on the wrong page here. Uh, And his great life of obedience by fulfilling the law, his great intercessory work, his promise to return So what actually might throw another wrench into this is, is this the obedience of Christ or the believer? And I think the text says it's those who walk according to the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit accounts for us fulfilling the requirement of the law. So I don't think it's it's Jesus or you. I think it's the Holy Spirit who now, uh, under the new covenant, I'm going to give you a new heart and give you the Holy Spirit so that you can keep the requirement of the law. This is so good. God produces his requirement in us by putting his spirit within us and by faith in what the Son of God has done to give us desires for his will and not rebellion to his will, which is to love. And I just want to love as I look at Christ and the spirit is putting him on display in my heart through this inspired word of God, I'm seeing the beauties and the glories of Christ. And I don't know about you, when you see that, what should come out by the spirit? I just love God. I just love others. The spirit's going to produce what the law never could do. And it produces agape. The work of Christ in verse three is so that the Spirit of God might live in us so that we could fulfill what God has always wanted and His good law. That's the whole Bible right there. The Spirit's power 
producing this fruit in our lives called love is the greatest need of our country right now. The lack of love and care and concern and hatred and suspicion and canceling and slander, attacking, hating unbelievers, (laughs) showing love to anyone different. Oh, what a light will be if we keep the requirement of the law and we now go love with the love of God by his spirit dwelling within us. It's going to be a power. That's your best, uh, um, what's, what's it, uh, when you're trying to argue and defend the faith? That's your be- who said that? It's your best apologetic is love. That one belongs to God. And that's going to shine and be a bright light in our day and age. It's going to make a difference. And always so good. So through the gospel of Christ and his spirit, we can love God and other people. We can be the heart of God in this world to my spouse, to my kids, my brothers and sisters in Christ. How about to my enemies? To those who are in darkness? I'm going to get mean. How about Dr. Fauci? Joe Biden, these are real things. Has God given me a love for every image bearer on this earth? For evangelism and missions. The love that you have when an unbeliever walks into this building and smells different and looks different and acts different. The application is so big and so far reaching this morning. What is your Christianity? The gospel that has taken up your heart, is it the spirit producing in you love? And now you don't have two tablets of stone, but the spirit's leading you to a million different ways to love God and love other people. Not by command and wrath compelling you, but the love of Christ. We love because he first loved us. We're on holy ground. And I'm going to say this out of love. This could be salvation for some of you here this morning. Your so-called Christianity has done nothing but create hate in your heart. For those who hold a different theology, a hatred. Those who hold a different political view, Those who grew up outside the church. The law of God isn't fulfilled in you. It's just the opposite. And you hide behind conservatism and beliefs. This heart that hates. You have factions, enmity, slander, lack of love, coldness. I have a message for you this morning. What the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did. Sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. All of your lovelessness and hatred this morning, you should should go to hell forever because he's a holy God and you're violating him. And he sent his son into the world to die for your loveless heart. And he hung on that tree, love incarnate, bowing his head in your place so that you could be forgiven for all of this lovelessness that is in your heart. Don't cover it up with religion and, you know, I'm going to change, I'm going to fix myself with law and all these things. This morning, you're just open. And there's a Savior who, who knows all of it and says, come to me who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest for your soul. Don't let 30 years of religion get in the way of Christ this morning. Filled with the Spirit. The first fruit is love to God. And then husbands, loving your wives like Christ loved the church. Fathers and children and wives. And so I'm going to close. But I got to answer one last really big question 
that without it, many, I think, are going to stumble over this passage. And I, I, as a shepherd, I want to help you with this last point. As I look at my life, you mean to tell me, Pastor, the, the little bit of love that I see is me fulfilling the law? I got no hope. God has set the bar awfully low, if you can count this. As I walk in the Spirit, I can fulfill the law of God truly, but not exhaustively. I'm going to close with 10 points that I heard this week from a preacher, pastor named John Piper. And I'm just going to quote real quickly some of the things that he said, because it, it helped me. Number one, fulfilling the requirement of the law of love that we're looking at, the law um, that, that comes to this gospel. It comes from faith in the finished work of Christ, not trying to do it ourselves. So don't throw away our whole order, our whole foundation, everything we've looked at to just go say, now I'm going to go love harder so I can be right with God. Don't flip there this morning. Jesus' love is your only hope to ever stand in the presence of God. He fulfilled it. Second, fulfilling the requirement of the law refers to a life of real love for people. Don't love with hypocrisy. And so this fulfillment is going to begin to be able to change the way you love, and there can now be sincere love. I'm going to hit that in a second. And third, this kind of love is rendered by the Holy Spirit and not ourselves. You can't muster it up. It, it comes from the Holy Spirit uniting you to Jesus, abiding in Him, and that love coming out through the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Fourth, this kind of love is produced by faith in Christ. It's believing everything we've studied about what He's done and who He is. And as I believe that, a fruit's going to come out of that. Faith. Number five, this kind of love is not a perfected love in this life, okay? It's not perfected. There's remaining sin. We're right back at Romans 7. There's a battle to love. You have to command people who battle with remaining sin, quit loving with hypocrisy. It means that we're loving with hypocrisy. Stop. Quit doing it, believers. Number six, this love will be a perfect love when I see the perfect love face to face. And so this love that I want perfectly is going to come. And I can't imagine what it's going to feel like to love perfectly God and others. That's what's coming at the end of this. Number seven, this love, it is true and real. So though not perfect, it's changed. And when I was an unbeliever, it was, it was untrue and it was unreal. And it was faked for what I could get from anybody. And you use everybody. And that's all you're ever doing. And now for the first time by this gospel, I can love and care and have some genuine and some sincerity about other people. Number eight, this love is called the law of Christ or the law of liberty. Paul said, I'm, I'm not under law, but I'm under the law of Christ. And I, I see the law of the Christ and the law of liberty is now that this, this new standard. It's Jesus, the way he loved us. And so this is what it is. This is the, the fullness of why we can just look at him because he, he is the model and the example of all of it. And so if I want to live the law of Christ now under the new covenant, it's this, this love. This is, this is fulfilling the law, the law of Christ. Number nine, Christ is where all of this love is to be found. His perfect love is the grounds of my acceptance and always will be. I'm going to find this love in Christ and in Christ alone. And he's always going to be my reason for being accepted. My love will never be enough to make me acceptable to God. But his was, and he was raised from the dead to tell us it was a sufficient love. And number 10, he's the end of the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness so that he gets all the glory. It's all what he has done and all who he is. And I just want him to be put on display and gloried and everyone marvel at him this morning. And so one last thought is back at Romans 13, 8, and I'll close out. Paul says that love fulfills the whole law. And just three verses later, and this do, knowing the time that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, 
For salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and sensuality and strife and jealousy, all a bunch of unloving activities and thoughts. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for its lust. So here you are, you fulfill the law. And now you better stop and quit and put on the, the armor of light. So believers, guys, we, we can fulfill the law with this heart of love and still battle sin and struggles and all of that. So this is not a call to perfection. And I'm going to close out with one last illustration and I'll let you be. In AD 133, there was a teacher of philosophy who presented a defense of Christianity to the emperor Hadrian. And, and as we look at this, this is his explanation for why Christianity was growing like fire. Uh, and, and he's an unbeliever. <clears throat> he said, Christ died and was buried. And they say that after three days, he rose and ascended to heaven. And then these 12 disciples went forth into all the kingdoms of the world, telling of his greatness with all humility and sobriety. Whence they who will serve the righteousness of his preaching are called Christians who are well known. Now the Christians, O King, have the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ himself engraven on their hearts, and they observe looking for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. They commit neither adultery nor fornication, nor do they bear false witness. They do not deny a deposit nor covet other men's goods. They, they honor their father and mother and love their neighbors. They give right judgment and they do not worship idols in the form of man. They do, not, they do not unto others that which they would have done unto themselves. They comfort such as, the, the, as those who wrong them and they make friends with them. They labor to do good to their enemies, their meek and gentle. As for their servants or handmaids or their children, if any of them has any, they, they persuade them to become Christians for the love that they have toward them. And when they have become so, they call them without distinction brethren. They despise not the widow, and they grieve for the orphan. He that have distributeth liberally to him that hath not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and rejoice over him as if it were their own brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the spirit in God. And if they hear that any of their number is imprisoned or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it is possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and they have not an abundance of necessities, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. For Christ's sake, they're ready to lay down their lives so that the law of God might be fulfilled in us. That's the message to American Christianity. And I pray it's the message for Southside Bible Church and that God would be pleased to bear that fruit as we behold this gospel and believe it and treasure it and live into it. Let's play. Play. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I've been humbled in this word. And I thank you that what you've always wanted from your children is their heart. And all the law could do was cause it to rebel. Stir up more sin and hatred and rebellion to you. And so the law was weak and what it could not do because of our flesh, you did by sending your son into this world. And you condemned all of our lovelessness, all of these hearts that have hated you and hated others. And you put your own son on a tree and put our sin on him and pierced him through for our transgressions. God, I thank you that now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I thank you that you set us free from the spirit of sin and death by your spirit. And God, you've put this law within our heart. You've changed it. And we know we love this lawgiver. And so God, we want to fulfill the law of Christ. We look at him and we want to love the way he has loved us. And God, now by your spirit within us, there's a way to love like no other. There's a way to love that we couldn't do when we were in Adam. 
There's a love that should be so distinct and separate from this world. And you're going to tell us to not be conformed to this world in a few chapters. God, I pray, don't let us be conformed to a world that is growing in hatred and evil and unlove. God, let us be a city set on a hill. And by this beautiful gospel and seeing the beauties of Christ and looking to him by this spirit, may this fruit cause us now to walk and serve others. Let us fulfill what you desire and break down any lies or walls that have surrounded people when they walked in this building. Just kick them down like the walls of Jericho even now and change and transform us to be a people who walk and live and love like Jesus Christ, who is in us by the Spirit. God, let that be the transformation that each and every one of us need. And let us lock shields and get into community groups, into prayer groups, and help each other learn how to live this way. God, let us help each other as a body and as a family. And I pray that all the glory would go to you and, and you would be praised and honored and glorified. And it's in your name that we do pray. Amen.